Well, good morning and welcome to our Lord's Day worship at Grace Community Church. We're thankful to be able to worship our Lord, uh, whether it's through a video recording like this or, uh, or gathered together. And, and we do have a small group gathered today uh, for this recorded service. Uh, most of you know that uh, we are resuming Sunday service this weekend as well. Uh, we have Sunday services at 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, now, there are significant limitations on the size and the, uh, the length of our service at this time, uh, and emails have gone out uh, with all of those details, but we are thankful to the Lord that we are moving in the right direction. Uh, and we are going to continue to make a recorded worship service available for the time being. Uh, we know some cannot attend uh, in person for various reasons, and we want to continue to minister to you. Now, regarding our ministry schedule, we will continue our Bible studies on Sunday evening uh, and Wednesday evening. So, Pastor Paul Shirley will continue his study through the book, Trusting God, uh, Sunday evening to, uh, uh, at, at 6 p.m. Uh, and then this coming Wednesday evening, Pastor Paul Lidke will continue leading us through uh, the study of the book of 1 John. And we're going to continue emailing out our Monday morning podcasts as well. So we hope that you'll take advantage of all of these ministry opportunities. Uh, and please remember to contact the church if you have any needs, whether uh, that's a need for counseling or prayer or uh, encouragement, or you have questions or, or even practical needs. Uh, the church is here to meet needs. And so please contact uh, the pastors or any of the elders uh, if there are needs. Well, I'd like to uh, call us to worship this morning by reading Psalm 130. And, and here we're reminded that our God is a forgiving God. He has forgiven our sins, and he's redeemed us through the, the, the saving work of Christ. We're also reminded that our hope is in our sovereign God. It's not in governors, it's not in uh, medical science, it's not in anything in this world. And so we wait with confidence for the perfect timing uh, of our Lord. And uh, as we wait, we pray, right? Because he is a God who hears and answers prayer. So Psalm 130, and, and this is the word of God. A song of the saints. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with Him is plentiful redemption, and He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we do come today to praise you, to give thanks to you, to bless your holy name. We come before you, Lord, with reverential fear and awe. Lord, you know us intimately. You know everything about us. You know our sins. You know our hypocrisy, our sinful fears, our pride, our, our selfish motives. And you love us anyway. You set your love on us before the foundation of the world. You have forgiven our sins and redeemed us through the blood of Christ. We stand righteous in your presence because of our union with Christ. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for that marvelous truth. Lord, it's easy for us to get frustrated and impatient with our circumstances, whatever they may be. We ask for your forgiveness for that, Lord. You call us to persevere through trials and to be content with our circumstances, to wait on you and to hope in your word, as the psalmist says. Lord, we need your help to do that. 
And Lord, you are our sovereign God. Your plans are perfect. You are working in every circumstance for our eternal good and for your glory. And so, Lord, we pray for your protection from the uh, unique temptations that may uh, 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 we may be experiencing during this time. And, and help us also, Lord, to be uh, sensitive to the unique opportunities for ministry and evangelism that you have given us at this time and to be faithful to take advantage of those opportunities. But Lord, we continue to pray for our missionaries, for the Johnstons and the Willoughbys, as well as the faithful pastors in Kenya. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them and encourage them and provide and protect, provide for and protect them, Lord, uh, particularly during these challenging times. And Lord, we pray as well for those within our church body who still must view this service from home and are unable to be here with us. Lord, we ask for your special grace and encouragement for them. And Lord, we continue to pray for our brother Jim McThaney and his family as they mourn the passing of Charlotte. Lord, we pray for your comfort and your mercy and encouragement and strength for Jim at this time. And so Lord, as we come now, we pray that you will prepare our hearts that we may worship you in spirit and in truth with our whole being. We pray, Lord, that we may be encouraged and convicted and changed by your word this day. And we pray, Lord, that your word would produce gospel fruit in our lives by your grace and that your great name will be magnified in all of it. And we do pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I invite you, if you're able, if you're here with us or if you are at home, you can stand and we'll, we have the opportunity to sing praises to the Lord. Um, so you can turn your attention to the words on the screen to your left on the front wall as we sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, or if you're at home, you should have received an attachment uh, in the email that this recording was sent out on. You can Go ahead and click on that and find our first song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, as we sing of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Verse 2. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam Come to save the hell-bound man Christ the great and sure fulfillment Of the law in Him we stand Come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. 
Come behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grave could e'er restrain him Praise the Lord, he is alive What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes We have one more song this morning. We'll go ahead and sing Wonderful, Merciful Savior. You can scroll down on the insert in the email and find Wonderful, Merciful Savior, and we'll sing about where we turn to find the grace that we need in our time of need, where we turn to for help to endure. So let's sing together Wonderful, Merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper Spirit we long to embrace You offer hope when our hearts Have hopelessly lost the way Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. 
can go ahead and be seated. Well, it is so wonderful to be back together this weekend, to be able to meet together. Certainly, we recognize it's on a limited basis, and we're praying, and we're waiting, and we're working towards being able to have our fellowship fully restored. Uh, But in the meantime, it is a wonderful gift that we're able to be back together Uh, Certainly, uh, in terms of my ministry as your pastor, this is an important step for me. It makes my job a lot easier. In fact, this is necessary. We can't stay apart forever. You know, if you're tempted to read articles and things that say, hey, the church is not a building and we don't really have to gather to keep being the church, well, uh, frankly, that's just not true. We cannot fulfill the function of a church if we're not together. Uh, In fact, my ministry... Peter says that uh, pastors, elders are to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. We have to be among one another if we are going to be able to do what the Lord has required us to do as a church. So right now we're waiting and uh, we recognize the providential circumstances that we're in and we're rejoicing that we're able to come back together kind of in waves this weekend uh, to be able to meet and worship the Lord together. Uh, This really is an important step, and we pray that it's a first step uh, towards the Lord relenting and us being able to be back together really in every sense of the word. And so I am pleased to be with you this morning, and I'm pleased to be able to open up God's word together with you. And as we prepare to study God's word, will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank You for Your Word in these troubling times filled with confusion, filled with anxiety, filled with frustration. Lord, Your Word really is a spiritual oasis for us to run to. It's a place where we can go and drink the living water that You provide for us in Your Son, Jesus Christ. It's a place where we can go to cut through all the lack of clarity that we find when we listen to all the differing voices in the world. It's a place where we can go to and fellowship with You. So we thank You for Your Word and we thank You that we can, even in this limited way, resume our corporate worship services to study Your Word together. And Lord, we've been so thankful to be able to share in the study of Your Word through these recordings and We're thankful that that can continue for those who are unable to be with us for corporate worship and they can still study with us, but we also rejoice at the opportunity to resume our our corporate worship services. And we look forward to the day when our entire church can gather together as we have previously done. But until then, we pray that you would sustain our souls and, and even now we pray that you would fix our eyes on the truth. Uh, We pray especially for those who may be watching this recording or hearing this study that don't know you. We pray that they would have an accurate understanding of who Christ is and what He has done as they hear Your Word. And we pray that Your Spirit would use Your truth to bring them to a saving knowledge of the Savior. Lord, we pray also that You would comfort and console our hearts that you would give us spiritual stability even as we turn to your word this morning and of course we pray all of these things in Christ's name amen well I want to invite you to turn with me in your copy of scripture to Galatians chapter 4 verses 8 through 11 I've titled this morning's message the marks of adoption. And if you've been studying with us in Galatians chapter 4, you know that we've been studying about the doctrine of adoption. Paul has been writing to the churches in Galatia to help them understand that both salvation and sonship are gifts of grace that can only be received through faith. Really, Paul was writing to a group of churches that were beginning to think that they needed a new style of ministry if they really wanted to be close to God. And as we come to 
chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, what we're going to find in these verses is that Paul has a growing concern about the people in these churches because they were not acting like sons of God. Instead, they were reverting back to some of the patterns from their unbelieving days. So look with me, Galatians chapter 4, and I'll begin reading in verse 8. Here the scriptures say, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. A family resemblance is something that none of us can escape. We're all going to look like and act like our families. In fact, this past October, I was down in Florida for my dad's retirement party. He was retiring from the fire department after many years of distinguished service. And I was there and one of his newer firefighters whom I had never met just walked up to me with this amazed look on his face and said, you're like a weird younger clone of Captain Shirley and was just shaking his head. I, I can't get away from the family resemblance. If you've ever seen my dad, I look like my dad. Better looking than my dad, but I look like my dad. Can't get away from it. And of course, family resemblance is not just a physical resemblance. The, the impact that family life has on all of us is something that we can't run away from. Just last week, I could not distinguish the difference between my daughter's handwriting and my wife's handwriting which is kind of scary when you think about the possibilities of, that my daughter could run with on that. But that's not genetics. That's just the influence of family life. God has designed family life to be one of the most significant influencing factors on who we are as individuals. Family life affects all of our life. And in the ancient world, conformity to family norms was even more important and more powerful than it is today. In the ancient world in which Paul was living and writing to the Galatian churches, your livelihood, your social status, your religious practices, they were all determined by which family you belong to. Each family in the Roman world even had its own family religion. So in the ancient world, there was nothing. There was nothing more important than your obligation to represent your family well. And this is especially true if you were adopted into that family. We've talked a lot about what Ro uh, Roman adoption was in the ancient world and how a, a father would choose to adopt an adult son, not because that person was in need, but because that person would be a qualified heir to lead the family after he was gone. That meant that this individual, this son who was being adopted in the family, had an obligation to conform to family life and then to continue that family life on for the next generation. And all of this is important for us because it provides the background for the New Testament's language about family and adoption by God. Through the grace of adoption, we as believers have been brought into the family of God through the person and work of Christ. Christ came and He lived and He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven so that through faith in Him, we could be forgiven of our sins and adopted into the family of God. In fact, this very day, if you don't know God, if your sins have never been forgiven, you can be forgiven today and adopted into God's family by believing in Christ. That's the grace of the gospel. That's the grace of adoption. And this is, as we've studied already, an incredible privilege that comes with infinite blessing and includes the fact that we are now heirs of God with Christ Jesus. So this is quite the privilege, this is quite the honor to be adopted into God's family. But it's also something that comes with new 
spiritual realities and responsibilities. We have an opportunity to be conformed by life in God's family to the image of our Savior Christ Jesus. And we have a responsibility to represent our Heavenly Father well. Our adoption does not depend upon our faithfulness to these things, but our adoption is so that we can be faithful in these things. And the problem when Paul was writing to these Galatian churches is they weren't showing signs of their adoption. They weren't fulfilling their responsibilities. That their life wasn't conforming to the life of God's family. In fact, instead of that kind of transformation take, taking place, there were actually some significant concerns that the Apostle Paul had about these churches. You see, Paul was working with the assumption that most of the people in these congregations were in fact saved. That's why in verse 7 he says, You are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. It's also why in chapter 3 he refers to them as brothers. So Paul was assuming that most of these people were in fact genuine believers. However, As Paul examined their lives and their ministry and their theology, Paul was increasingly concerned about the trajectory that they were on and the fact that they were not acting like adopted sons of God. Instead of conforming to the family life that they were taught through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, these Galatian churches were turning to a new style of ministry. A style of ministry that they hoped would bring them closer to God, closer to God than the Gospel had brought them. Of course, that was concerning for Paul. And in our verses for this morning, Paul actually identifies four specific concerns that he had about these Galatian churches and the trajectory that they were on. And what's interesting for us about these four concerns is they help us to understand better what life in God's family is like and how the family life of the Father should influence us. So we're going to look at these concerns this morning, beginning in verse 8, where Paul expresses his first concern. Here in verse 8, we find that Paul is concerned with the Galatians' ignorance. They, They were acting ignorant. That life in the family of God revolves around the truth of God and increasing knowledge of God's Word and an increasing knowledge of God as our Father. In contrast, life outside of the family of God is characterized by spiritual darkness, by alienation from God, by an ignorance of God. And the problem with these Galatian churches is that rather than growing in their knowledge of God, they were reverting back to their unbelieving ignorance. That's why Paul was concerned. And it's worth noting that the kind of spiritual ignorance that Paul was specifically concerned about was an ignorance that is rooted in unbelief. Sometimes people are ignorant of things just because they haven't been taught, because they don't know what they don't know. But the kind of ignorance that Paul is worried about in the Galatian churches is is a kind of lack of knowledge that's rooted in a lack of faith. In fact, notice at the beginning of verse 8, Paul says formally, when you did not know God. And here, knowing God refers to a relational knowledge of God that's only possible through faith. It's not just knowing about God. It's not just knowing facts of theology. It is knowing God. I know about the President of the United States. I do not know the President of the United States. I know my wife. I have a personal relationship with her. That's the kind of knowledge of God that Paul is talking about here. And so when he says, formerly, when you did not know God, he's talking about their unbelieving days before they came to a saving knowledge of the gospel. This is in direct contrast with what he says in verse 7 when when he says, you are no longer a slave but a son. As sons, they had the Spirit at work in their hearts crying out, Abba, Father. You cry out, Abba, Father, to God because you know Him. You know Him as your Father. 
So here, really what Paul's doing is he's reminding them that before their conversion, their lives were completely characterized by an unbelieving ignorance. Which theologically is a good reminder that by nature we are all culpably ignorant of God. But by our own nature, in our own power, we cannot come to a saving knowledge of God or right understandings of the implication of His truth for our life. It is an undeserved grace of adoption that we can have a genuine relationship with God that is rooted in His truth. This is not something that we boast about. We we, we as believers don't say, well, yeah, we know God and His truth because we figured it out and you didn't. No, this this is a grace. We look at the world and say, They don't know God, and they obviously don't know God's truth. Well, yes, but that would be us were it not for the grace of God in our life. It's not natural for us to know God. It's not natural for us to believe His truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural person, this is the person who has not been forgiven in Christ, this is the person who has not been saved through faith in Christ, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And of course, in contrast with that, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. To this, we would also add Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, which says of us when we were unbelievers, that we were darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in us due to our hardness of heart. By nature, the kind of ignorance that Paul is talking about here, not knowing God because of unbelief, that was description of all of us. And this is startling. And this is dangerous because as Paul goes on to point out, this kind of spiritual unbelieving ignorance always leads to spiritual enslavement. Paul says, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. In other words, when you do not know God, and when you do not know God's truth, you are always vulnerable to the dominating influence of error in your life. You have no way, if you do not have God's truth, if you do not have a saving knowledge of God through Christ Jesus, you have no way to know whether or not you're wasting your life. You have no way of knowing whether or not what you're pursuing is true or erroneous. You have no way of knowing whether or not what you're doing with your life will have eternal value or not. You are enslaved to your own ignorance. See, as Paul points out here, when you do not know the truth about God, inevitably you end up serving things that are not God. And really... This was true in Paul's day, it's true in our day. uh, Demonic, false religions continue to enslave millions of people around the world because they don't know God. Satan has created all kinds of false worldviews and false religious uh, systems that, that try to assuage the conscience of people because they know they're sinners, they know they're culpable, but they try to hide that. And so Satan gives them all these opportunities, a cornucopia of false religions to try to calm their conscience. And that's what Paul's talking about here. If you don't know God and His truth, you will fall prey to one of these enslaving satanic systems. Really, the the, the principle here is that a life not guarded by the truth is a life that is open to false religion and demonic influence. And the only thing that can set you free from this kind of enslavement, the only thing that can set you free from bondage to error is a true knowledge of God that comes from the Scriptures. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 8 said, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The problem with the Galatians, 
is that they were not abiding in God's truth. This pre-salvation ignorance that Paul points out in verse 8, they were reverting back to it. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. They were reverting back into their unbelieving and enslaving spiritual ignorance. And that's not what should happen in God's family. Life in God's family should have resulted in a deeper knowledge of God, but instead they were departing from the truth. And as we consider the ignorance of the Galatians, it's a good reminder for us that if we are not growing in our knowledge of God and His truth, we are opening ourselves up to all kinds of dangerous influences, including what we think might be worship that's actually not directed to God at all. In fact, how many people who claim to be Christians, or maybe some of them even are Christians, what they call worship is not directed towards God at all because they don't know the truth of Scripture well enough to discern the difference between the two. This, by the way, is why in God's family, theology is important. Not so that we can win theological debates and arguments. I don't care about those. Not so we can say we've read big books or whatever. I don't care about that. It's because theology is the truth of God. And the more we know the truth of God as it's revealed in Scripture, the more we know God. And it protects us from unintentionally worshiping things that are not God. This is how we protect ourselves in God's family, by submitting to God's truth. Family members of God know God. They know Him. And they need to increasingly know the difference between the true God and those things that by nature are not God. In fact, as adopted children, this is an area where we should see increasing growth in. If you think, well, I know the Gospel, that's good enough for me. Well, the Galatians knew the Gospel at one point. But because they weren't growing in that knowledge of life in God's family, they were reverting back to their unbelieving ignorance. That's a danger we need to watch out for. We need to watch out for this ignorance that was exhibited in the Galatian churches. But there was a second concern that Paul had as well, and we find this second concern in verse 9. Here Paul expresses additional concern over the Galatians' idolatry. See, if you don't grow in the knowledge of God, you run the risk of serving those things that are not God. That's what Paul's saying here, and that's really what idolatry is. When you prioritize and serve and give your life to those things which by nature are not God, that is idolatry. And for us, as believers in Christ, as adopted sons and daughters in God's family, part of joining God's family, a significant part of jo joining God's family, means that we have repented of our idolatry so that, in the words of 1 Thessalonians 1.9, we can serve the living and true God. However, in verse 9, Paul points out that the Galatians were actually returning to new forms of their old idols. You see, in verse 9, the, the main statement, the main verb, the main grammatical point in verse 9 is that Greek word that's translated in your English Bible, turn back, epistrephete. This is a word in the New Testament that is ordinarily used to describe repentance, turning away from sin and self, unto God but here the apostle Paul uses this word to describe what really is a reverse repentance back to idolatry like like Israel in the wilderness the Galatian churches wanted to turn back to their old taskmasters and for Paul it was more than a little bit concerning to see them going backwards rather than forwards it's kind of like in the book of Proverbs, where it, where it talks about the dog who returns to his vomit, the Galatians were returning to their idols 
And in doing so, by, by turning back towards idolatry in their hearts, they were turning away from a personal relationship with God that is built on His truth. Notice Paul says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. And, and Paul throws this phrase in here just as a reminder of what they were departing from. If you want to pursue legalism, if you want to pursue righteousness through the law, if you want to pursue worship through ceremony, just know that what you're departing from is a, 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 a relationship with God that means you know Him and He knows you. And Paul here is reminding them that they're no longer outside the family of God. They're no longer ignorant of Him. They're no longer blind to His truth. And by the way, the reason why the Galatians were no longer ignorant of these things is the same reason all of us can say that we know God. It's because God first knew us. That's why Paul says, you know God, or rather, you have been known by God. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because He first loved us. 1 Corinthians 8.3 says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. That's the kind of mutual gracious, loving, and undeserved relationship that Paul is highlighting here. And, and whenever you choose to revert back to your old idolatry, that's the relationship that you're departing from. When, when we run back to our idols, we're running away from a gracious, loving, and mutual relationship with God our Father. Idolatry is just valuing something more in your life than you value knowing God and being known by God. That's what idolatry is. I'll say that again. Uh, idolatry is valuing something in your life more than you value knowing God and being known by God. Idolatry really is just a repeat of Adam's sin over and over again. He forfeited the opportunity to walk with God so that he could satisfy his appetites. That's what we do when we turn back to our idolatry. For us as adopted children to, to revert back into idolatry, to, to prioritize things in our life over God. It's like saying that we want all the rewards of being an adopted son except for a relationship with the Father. It's like a prodigal son version of family life hey dad i'm sure i'm glad i am your son because i'm going to get all your money when you die by the way i wish you were dead now can i go ahead and have my money because i don't want a relationship with you that's the kind of idolatry that the prodigal son had to repent of that's the kind of idolatry that we had to repent of in order to follow christ and that's the kind of idolatry that we have to repent of ongoingly whenever we see it in our lives the problem is that the Galatians weren't repenting of it. In their idolatry, they were turning away from this mutual knowledge, this mutual relationship with God, so they could turn back to their old idols. Paul says in verse 9, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? He adds, whose slaves you want to be once more. Now what's really interesting is, what were the Galatians doing? Well, the next verse is going to reveal that they were trying to copy the Old Testament ceremonies. All these ceremonial and ritual laws that God had put in place to point to the coming of Christ. Laws that were given temporarily. Laws that became obsolete once Christ came. That they were a means of grace for Old Testament believers to prepare them for Christ, but to go back to them now would be to ignore the fact that Christ has already come. Those were the laws that the Galatians wanted to go back to. But what I find interesting here is that, that Paul says, do you again want to go back to these idols? Well, the Galatians were Gentile believers. They had never been to the temple in Jerusalem before in all likelihood. They had never followed any of these laws or ceremonies. So how is it that Paul could say, do you want to go back to them? Well, the answer is that in their hearts, the reason why they wanted all these ceremonies is because it appealed to the old idols that they had in their hearts anyway. It was elementary principles. Elementary principles. 
Paul's already lumped together Old Testament ceremonies and elementary principles of uh, pagan religions. And, and what he's saying here is that those Old Testament ritual, ritual laws no longer possess any more power than paganism. Isn't that amazing? Paul, Paul lumps in trying to go back and copy the Mosaic Covenant with paganism. That pointed to Christ. Christ has already come. So to go back to that would be to act as if Christ had not come. And the reason why you want to go back to that is the same reason why you loved your old pagan religion. You loved the way the ceremonies made you feel. You loved a spiritual life that instead of being based on faith and the truth was based on ceremonies and rituals and things that you could touch and see and feel. That's what this reverse repentance was. When the false teachers came in and said, you've got to go back and you've got to observe all these ceremonies, that just triggered all those old patterns of idolatry in the Galatians' heart to love ritualism. And this is significant because this kind of reverse repentance still happens all the time. In fact, there are a lot of churches that build their entire ministries upon this kind of reverse repentance by trying to create an experience at church that stimulates something in you from your unbelieving days to say, look, you can have your idol and Jesus at the same time. You can go to church and it's just like the Rock concerts that you used to love to go to. You can go to church and it's, it's just like the coffee houses that you love to waste your life away in. You could go to church and, and it's not like church. It's just like the TED Talks that you love to watch on the internet. In other words, whatever you like about life in this world, we'll make the church like that. That's what was going on in Galatia. They found the ceremonial laws compelling because it stimulated the old idolatry in their hearts. Wow. We can have Jesus and we can have that same feeling we had when we sacrificed things in our pagan religion. Of course, they couldn't. That's not how life in God's family works. Life in God's family and our worship of God is marked by a repentance from idolatry so that we can honor the Lord in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 says, But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Which can only be done by faith. Galatians loved their idols. They loved ceremony. They loved doing all of these things, and they were ready to turn back to them. Of course, that's a violation of family life. Members of God's family have repented from idolatry to serve the God they know, and they must continually pursue repentance of the temptation to turn back to old idols. I remember somebody telling me one time, yeah, I don't really go to church, you know, you don't have to be at church to be the church. You know, all these things that ignore specific commands of Scripture. I said, well, what do you do on the weekends? Oh, I love to go play golf and I pray in between every hole. And that's how I worship. Well, what is that besides taking your idol and, and try to baptize it in the Christian language so that you get your idol in Jesus all at the same time? It doesn't work that way. It never works that way. Just like in Galatia, Jesus always evaporates and our idols always enslave us. That's why Paul was concerned about it. Paul was concerned about their ignorance. He was concerned about their idolatry. To this, we could also add from verse 10 a, a third concern Paul had, and that was for the Galatians' immaturity. Immaturity. The, they were going back to elementary principles. When are you in elementary school? When you're a child. They're childish principles. They were spiritually acting childish. Childish. 
See, maturity in the Christian life means growing in a faith that results in greater allegiance to Christ and increased fruits of the Spirit. That's maturity. A greater allegiance to Christ and, and, and fruits of the Spirit in your life. That's what maturity looks like. But the Galatians were saying, look, if we want to really be spiritual, if we really want to be mature, we've got to follow all of these external ceremonies. Specifically, they were trying to return back to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. This immaturity was reflected in their attempts to try to manufacture the Jewish religious calendar. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 10 when it says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. That they were essentially trying to reproduce the Old Testament liturgy at least as much as they could. Days, months, seasons, years. This is Paul's way of describing the the Old Testament calendar with all of its feasts and sacrifices and ceremonies. And by the way, Paul uses the present tense in verse 10. It says, you observe, observe here is in the present tense, which indicates that they must have already started doing these things in some way. And for Paul, this was nothing more than a return to elementary principles. It was immature. And it was immature on a number of levels. Practically, it was immature because you can't just pick and choose what parts of the law you're going to follow. In fact, in chapter 5, verse 3, Paul says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You can't pick and choose. You can't say, oh, I like this feast. Let's do Passover. Yeah, but we probably shouldn't do Yom Kippur because Jesus has already died, so we don't need another day of atonement. Yeah, you can't work that way. It's a covenant. It all goes together. It's immature to just pick and choose what you want. Theologically, it was also immature because these ceremonies pointed to Christ. Every last one of these ceremonies in the Old Testament calendar was intended to prepare the way for Christ, which meant going back to them was in essence a way of saying "Eh, Christ must not have come yet. Theologically, it was immature, and of course spiritually it was very immature. It revealed in these Galatian believers a desire to walk by sight and ceremony rather than faith and truth. Actually, in the book of Colossians, excuse me, Paul addressed this issue when he said in Colossians 2, 16 through 23, he said, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. These kind of ceremonies, they might make you feel a certain way in the middle of it, but they have no spiritual power. The truth of God believed in your heart is what has the power to cause you to grow. We need to note these things because this kind of immaturity is still common today. There are many churches out there that replace the centrality of Christ with ceremonies. In fact, if you read any of these deconversion stories of people leaving evangelical churches, almost always they're leaving a, a church where the truth is central to go to a church where ceremony is central. Roman Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, where it's all about the ceremony, not about the truth of Christ. 
In Paul's mind, it is a sign of significant immaturity to equate life in God's family with external customs and ceremonies rather than faith in the truth. As he said elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 5-7, Paul knew that we walk by faith, not by sight. Family members learn to trust God, not ceremonies and customs that are drawn from elementary principles. That's immature. That's immature. And that immaturity leads to one final concern that Paul had for the Galatians. And that was a concern he had over their independence. Their independence. In other words, their theology, their philosophy of ministry, their lives were increasingly self-reliant and self-made. They were reshaping the gospel that they had learned from Paul into a religion that they were more comfortable with. Instead of conforming to the family, they were increasingly trying to be independent and innovative. That's why Paul says in verse 11, I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. He was afraid that they were throwing it all the way so that they could come up with their own way of ministry, their own gospel. And this concern was well-founded. I mean, it wasn't just their theology of faith that was problematic. It was the reality of faith in their own hearts that Paul was concerned about. The, the real danger that many of these church members faced was the danger of defection, apostasy, to pursue their own self-religion. And this, by the way, when Paul says, I'm afraid I may have labored in vain over you, I'm afraid I may have preached the gospel to you in vain, all that we did was in vain, you're throwing it away. That's a stunning reminder of how dangerous it is to be self-reliant and self-sufficient in the Christian life. I mean, these young churches were disregarding the reality of their faith, uh, the, the realities that Paul had taught them about the faith to go their own way. Their pastor saw the problem. Their pastor was warning them of the problem, but they were blowing right past that warning. And this kind of independence is completely inappropriate for adopted children in the family of God. Now, Sometimes believers make the mistake of thinking that this kind of independence is a form of maturity. I figured out my own way. I, I didn't just take anybody else's word for it. I, I kind of uh, crafted my own view on this. It wasn't dependent upon anyone else. And they view that as a sign of maturity. When in fact, that is a sign of immature independence. This is especially a problem with young believers and young men who think that it's mature to be less dependent upon others that is a mistake it's actually a mistake that teenagers make in in their own family life as well oftentimes the problem that the friction that comes in the teenage years is because because sometimes parents and teenagers alike think that maturity means going off on your own and doing your own thing rather than growing in maturity within the life of the family Well, this kind of mistake is especially dangerous in the household of God where true maturity humbly seeks the influence and input of others. That's why Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way and imitate their faith. These believers weren't doing that with Paul. Hebrews 13 goes on in verse 17 and says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. That's mature. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Paul was groaning as he looked at the Galatians. All because they felt this need to be independent. When in reality, when they were adopted into the family, they should have increasingly tried to be dependent upon God their elder brother Christ, and their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. See, that family life of the household of God is really meant to be a protective grace in our lives. God placed us in the context of His family with brothers and sisters to disciple us, to protect us from bad influences. Our our freedom as sons is not a freedom to create our own way to worship, 
Our freedom is a freedom from selfishness so that we can worship and learn from those around us. In fact, if you constantly feel the urge to express your independence from others and their opinion and godly leaders, that's probably a sign of something troubling in your heart. You know, I've, I've known people before that's just like, well, what, whatever the most famous preacher says, even if he's been reliable, I'm going to disagree. Oh, MacArthur said this. I'm, I, you know, I don't really go with MacArthur. Piper said this. I don't really go with Piper. My pastor says this. Well, maybe, but I'm not going to go with that until I can verify it on my own. Well, certainly you're responsible for your own faith, but at the same time, if your attitude is you always want to express your maturity by your own independent thought, that's the kind of dangerous sentiment that got the Galatians into trouble and had the Apostle Paul wondering, are you even believers? Family members who resist the influence of family life should be concerned about the trajectory of their faith. That's what Paul was worried about. Rather than growing in conformity to the family, they were drifting away from family life. They were manifesting ignorance and unrepentant idolatry and perpetual immaturity and dangerous independence. And these concerning marks continue to be common characteristics in the lives of those who are struggling in the Lord. Because really, life in God's family is designed to be the exact opposite of this. In contrast with these Galatians, those who benefit most from life in God's family are those who have a faith that is rooted in knowledge, whose devotion is sealed with repentance, and whose worship is driven by truth. These are individuals who practice a submission to God and to those around them. And that's what life in God's family looks like. And that's what we're striving after. And of course, that's what we're praying for the Lord to give us grace so that we can see in our own lives. We pray with me. Lord, we do thank you for this reminder from your word. We thank you for the truth that we are in your family by adoption. And we pray that that truth would continue to influence us more day by day. Lord, we pray for your people who are scattered because of all that's going on. We pray that you would continue to encourage and minister to their hearts. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I do want to thank those of you who are here for coming this morning to worship together with us. And I want to thank those of you watching on a recording for joining us via the internet. We're so thankful that you can participate in this study and and just as we prepare to depart our worship here and as you prepare to shut down your computer or device, I want to leave you with one final blessing from God's Word. From Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 25, where the Spirit writes, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you this day know the peace of Christ. Thanks for joining us.